Hope your work week is off to a good start. It's Monday, December 6th here in Korea, and you're watching The Daily Report. I'm Min Sun Hee. New prevention measures are in effect starting today as health authorities seek to rein in the outbreak here amid concerns of Omicron. We start now with the global pandemic update with our Kwon Soa. So let's begin here on the domestic front. Sure, Sunny. As you said, uh, we are starting the new work week with new antivirus measures, which will be in effect for four weeks. And uh, that is means that we will have a temporary halt to our phased return to our normal lives. It is needed, though, with COVID-19 related figures breaking record after record. So let's take a first look at the number of cases that was reported this Monday. 4,325 is the first time that we're seeing a figure above 4,000 on a Monday, which represents the numbers that have been tallied on Sunday. And that includes close to 4,300 domestic transmissions and almost 30 imported cases. Now, it is also a jump by more more than 1,000 infections compared to last Monday. And even over the weekend, we had cases hovering in the 5,000s. By region, there are 10 places in the country that have at least triple digit figures of infections. And the capitals, Hole and Gyeonggi-do province, still over 1,000 daily cases. Now let's move over to the total number of cases in Korea, which now stands at 477,358. We also got 41 additional COVID. COVID-19 related fatalities. Now moving over to the number of patients in serious or critical condition, that's been now in the 700s for the sixth straight day. Onto our vaccination front, uh, it was Sunday, uh, yesterday, so uh, usually we have lower numbers of daily inoculations on the weekend. But uh, if you compare the figure of the first and second dose, the number of booster shots is uh, much higher. If we take a look at the next page here, three 3,650 additional doses were administered on Sunday. Now let's move over to the figures abroad. We've got a rise by around 423,000 new COVID-19 infections in the span of 24 hours and close to 6,600 new fatalities. Now with soaring figures in Europe, Germany has surpassed the number of cases in Iran over the weekend and Italy has surpassed the number of cases in Colombia. Meanwhile, in in South Africa, uh, South Africa has hit the 3 million milestone with some 11,000 new cases reported in the past day. And those are the general updates I have for now, but I'll see you back in a bit. Sunny? All right, so thank you for now. Right, efforts to ease restrictions and embrace a new normal have been halted as authorities here respond to surging case counts and Omicron concerns. Shin Yeon joins me now with details on this reality. Yeon, welcome back. Thank you for having me, Sunny. Right, let's begin with the Omicron situation here in the local front then. Right, so on this Monday, 12 more Omicron cases have been confirmed, bringing the total tally to 24. But what's more worrisome than the numbers itself is where these infections occurred. The first Omicron cluster in the country was linked to a church in Incheon. But on Sunday, we saw three international students studying at universities here in Seoul infected with the Omicron variant after visiting the church in question. One student had come into contact with a total of 139 students in the library and 30 more at an offline class. So now we're just waiting to see just how much the Omicron variant has spread outside of Incheon area and whether a large community level outbreak is in progress. Right, Yeon, and against that backdrop, we have countermeasures in place as of this Monday, as I mentioned earlier, to deal with escalating caseloads and the potential risks, of course, of Omicron, right? Right, so as you just mentioned, we have new rules in place, which reverses some of the easing of restrictions that had taken place over the past month. The biggest change from Monday is the number of people that can meet up for social gatherings. In the capital region, only six people will be allowed to meet, which is down from the previous 10. And in other regions, only eight can meet, which has been lowered from 12. Only one unvaccinated person will be allowed in any group, regardless of its size in all regions, and this measure will be in effect from the next four weeks. Also, vaccine passes will now be required in restaurants and cafes. Up until now, proof of vaccination have only been required to access venues like indoor sports facilities, bars, nightclubs, singing rooms, and public baths. But now, people who want to eat out, visit a museum, or go to a movie theater 
must show their vaccine passes. If they're not vaccinated, they must submit a negative PCR test taken within two days. However, passes will still not be required for weddings, funerals, department stores, supermarkets, and outdoor sports facilities. A one-week grace period will be in place for these new vaccine pass requirements to allow time for these changes to settle in. Right, yeah, and thank you for now, but stay with us for the extended talk. Right, uh, let's now turn back to Soa, who is at the desk, with the latest government remarks about the COVID-19 situation on the local front. Uh, Soa, do start with Prime Minister Kim bok words earlier on this Monday morning, I believe. Right, Sonny, the Prime Minister said in the remainder of the year, the government will focus on four major tasks, which will be handling the Omicron variant, speeding up vaccinations, and expanding hospital beds, as well as home treatment. Presiding at a meeting this morning, a COVID-19 response meeting in Seoul and uh, scheduled to hold more in other regions across Gyeonggi-do province and Incheon this week. Prime Minister Kim in particular vowed for containment efforts in the capital area. He highlighted the growing threat posed by the Omicron variant as it appears to be certain now that the variant is highly contagious. With that, he stressed further spreads into the community must be prevented through stronger quarantine measures at the airport and faster contact training. Racing. Right now, so I hear the Prime Minister also addressed the ongoing controversy over vaccine passes, right? Yes, Sonny. There has been some backlash uh, by some unvaccinated individuals as well as uh, business owners. But uh, citing daily infection numbers in the 5,000s and also record breaking figures of patients in serious or critical condition, the Prime Minister asked for the public's understanding on this latest measure. Let's take a listen. 10... While 9 out of 10 adults have completed their vaccinations, the vaccine pass is aimed at protecting the unvaccinated from the risk of transmission in our everyday lives. We believe it is the minimum commitment that we all need to make to protect our entire community rather than a form of discrimination. The expansion of uh, the venues where vaccine passes will be needed, such as at cram schools, PC rooms and libraries, has in particular led to criticism from some parents of teenagers aged 12 and above, as the system is also slated to be in effect for teens starting in February. However, with the appearance of the Omicron variant, Prime Minister Kim bo gyeom stressed getting senior citizens as well as teenagers fully vaccinated has become even more important, adding vaccination can no longer be a choice. With that, he appealed for more cooperation among those aged 12 to 17 and ensured the government has secured enough doses for teenagers to receive two shots. So there is a divided opinion when it comes to the uh, vaccine passes that will also be applied on uh, teenagers because uh, on the one hand there are parents uh, that have also uh, had uh, some uh, petitions on the Tongwada website the presidential office's website against these vaccine passes but on the other hand there are also uh, parents that are citing high teenage vaccination rates abroad and uh, are hoping that their kids can uh, go to schools and other venues uh, more safely right meanwhile so what's the latest on the treatment front here. Uh, Sonny, the government plans to continuously expand hospital beds, especially ICU beds for critically ill patients. And uh, they are going to expand those to the extent in which 10,000 patients a day can be handled. Officials, meanwhile, have seen achievements in expanding medical capacity following the implementation of an administrative order last month, which resulted in the addition of some 2,400 hospital beds nationwide wide as of Sunday. Also, the effective operation of hospital beds, according to severity of symptoms, was able to fast-track treatment of some 340 critically ill patients in the past month. An expansion of the home recovery system will lower the burden on medical staff, meanwhile, with Prime Minister Kim renewing the safety of the scheme. <laughs> We're not suggesting that home treatment patients be abandoned all alone. Do keep in mind that patients are all managed individually and checked every hour. Also, they will be transferred to a hospital if there's something remotely unusual, so there's no need to feel anxious. 
Right, and as Hua mentioned, authorities are recommending home treatment as standard procedure, and that's because we simply don't have enough hospital beds to go around. And nationwide, there's more than 80% of all ICU beds are now in use amid the surge in critically ill COVID-19 patients. And the healthcare crunch is most evident in the Seoul and Incheon area. Um, Seoul has seen nearly 90% of all of its hospital beds fill up, while the figure in Incheon stands at 93%. Well, Yen, as you mentioned, a number above 90% in the capital region. That is alarming enough, but also in other places across the country, there are places where there is only a single digit or uh, double digit figure of hospital beds available, such as in the central part of the country. And that makes it also difficult to transfer pa uh, patients from the metropolitan area to these other places. So it is a nationwide uh, issue at this point. Right, so I guess it's not an exaggeration to say that COVID-19 is straining Korea's medical capacity to its limits, hence the need for a broader adoption of home treatment. And accordingly, COVID-19 patients who are either asymptomatic or have mild infections are being asked to treat themselves at home for 10 days. They're given home treatment kits and are monitored remotely by medical staff with oxygen levels and body temperature checked several times a day. If any unusual symptoms develop, the patients will be called in for hospital admission. Right. Meanwhile, you know, on the economic front, I understand more business owners have voiced pessimism over profits amid the enhanced measures to contain the latest situation. Tell us more. You're absolutely right. The easing of restrictions that started in Korea last month provided some much needed breathing room for small business owners. But now that it has been put on hold, businesses are expecting their fortunes to diminish in the weeks and months ahead. And the business survey index for small business owners in December dropped by 2.2 points from the previous month to 85.4 points. Um, BSI shows how people view the current market if the reading is below 100 it shows that people surveyed have relatively pessimistic views towards their future business performance. If the reading is above 100, it means they're relatively optimistic. And from September, we've seen the BSI steadily go up over anticipation of eased restrictions. But for the first time in three months, the index has gone down. And pundits attributed this drop to anxieties over the number of new COVID-19 infections reported during the time the poll was conducted. The latest BSI BSI survey was conducted on 2,400 business owners from November 18th to 22nd. And if you recall, at the time, the number of new COVID-19 infections went up to more than 3,000 per day, sparking concerns that Korea could put on hold its exit strategy and the gradual lifting of restrictions. So there are some uh, concerning factors, but also in the broader picture, there are some positive uh, prospects. For instance, the Bank of Korea in a report yesterday mentioned that despite the Omicron variant, uh, global economic recovery is expected to continue next year. And they have been citing some factors such as uh, some expectations on oral treatment and vaccinations in developing countries and in developed countries, more booster shots. Uh, so there are some uh, rosy prospects as well. And also uh, President Moon Jae-in here uh, mentioned today that Korea's trade is to post an all-time high of 1.2 trillion US dollars uh, this year. So we We'll, I probably have to wait and see whether this Omicron variant really is a factor that will uh, bring our economy down. Right. All right. So as always, thank you very much for that update. And Yeon, thank you. See you again on Tuesday. Thank you. Preliminary data suggests that Omicron shares genetic material with the virus that causes the common cold. In fact, researchers believe Omicron may have evolved within a person who was infected with both COVID-19 and the common cold. Our Kim Yansung reports. The Omicron variant may have a smidgen of the common cold virus attached to it, according to a new study. Scientists from Cambridge, Massachusetts-based data analytics firm Enference have attempted to bring more clarity to this newly emerged variant that experts around the world are currently scrambling to find answers to. They found that the Omicron variant may have picked up a morsel of the common cold virus in its mutation. 
This could potentially mean that the virus could transmit more easily and be more evasive to human immune response, while also displaying mild cold-like symptoms. But experts say that it's too early to write off the Omicron variant as completely innocuous. We don't know really what's going to happen once the variant hits potentially vulnerable populations. And then, of course, there's that question of long COVID. The virus so far has been detected in at least 38 countries, spreading like wildfire in 23 more countries in just two days. The strain has also been found in one-third of U.S. states already, according to local health officials. Early data suggests that Omicron is more contagious than Delta, and some say that it has the potential to upend Delta as a dominant strain. The World Health Organization says that the severity and the full impact of this virus strain will only become clear as time passes. Kim Yansen, Arirang News. And staying with Omicron, its outbreak over in Europe has authorities on high alert, while their counterparts in Israel and Brazil are turning to booster shots to prop up their defense. Kim Yosan has details. As concerns rise over the rapid spread of the Omicron variant of COVID-19, the European Center for Disease Prevention and Control says 182 cases have been identified across the EU plus Norway and Iceland. As of Sunday, it added the new variant has been reported in 17 of the countries it serves. The ECDC explained the majority of the cases are in people that have a history of traveling to Africa, but noted there's evidence in several European countries, such as Germany and Spain, which shows undetected community transmission could be ongoing there. It says all cases for which there is available information on severity were either asymptomatic or mild, adding no deaths have been reported so far. Israel says it's molding the possibility of authorizing a fourth COVID-19 booster shot to those with weak immune systems. In July, those undergoing cancer treatment in Israel were the first to receive a third shot. Saying the health authorities are due to discuss a fourth dose this week, local media outlets say officials are concerned about the spread of the Omicron variant. Brazil is also accelerating its rollout of booster shots in an attempt to contain the spread of the new strain. The Sao Paulo state government says it will shorten the interval for a third dose to four months from the previous five. Six cases of Omicron have been reported in Brazil, with all of them having recently returned from Africa. Kim Yosan, Arida News. On the local front, President Moon Jae-in has shared plans to diversify import sources and boost domestic production amid current disruptions within global supply chains. Speaking at an event to mark Korea's trade day on this Monday, President Moon also spoke of Korea's intentions to expand its export market as a regional trade deal involving countries within the Asia-Pacific arena takes effect next year. Efforts are reportedly underway to ensure similar trade arrangements with markets in Central America and the Middle East. President Moon also touched upon the importance of easing carbon footprints to allow for sustainable economic growth. Meanwhile, the pandemic has not kept the rich from getting richer here in the country. Our King Song Min tells us why. It seems like the pandemic hasn't left its mark on the rich in South Korea. Despite the raging virus and months of distancing measures, households whose income was in the top 10 to 30 percent of income, who are not the absolute richest but are still well off, saw their wealth climb over the past year. According to a recent report, the average total wealth of those in the top 10 to 30 percent bracket this year came to around 770,000 U.S. dollars, up around 20 percent from a year ago. Most of that wealth was in property, which came to around 630,000 U.S. dollars. In fact, the increase in wealth was largely driven by the growth in property this year, which jumped more than 23 percent from 2020. In terms of financial assets, more affluent people are turning away from traditional assets like savings, instead looking to invest in stocks. 
while the proportion of stocks jumped almost 9 percentage points to account for almost a quarter of their financial assets, the proportion made up of savings dropped. This reflects a changing trend in how people invest their assets, as more people this year said they prefer high-risk, high-return investment. And as more people turn to such investments during the pandemic, they believe that the value of labor activity has been undermined compared to the pre-pandemic era. They said their income growth has not kept pace with the rising value of property and other types of assets. Kim Sung-min, Arirang News. K-pop sensation BTS's four-day performance over in Los Angeles was reportedly one of the best-selling concerts in history. Our Han Sung-woo has more. K-pop sensation BTS's four concerts at the SoFi Stadium in Inglewood, California sold 214,000 tickets and grossed a whopping 33 million U.S. dollars, the most for any run of shows at a single venue in the world since 2012. According to Billboard Box Score, Permission to Dance on Stage Los Angeles, which ended Thursday local time, recorded the biggest U.S.-based box score in 18 years and the second biggest ever in North America, only behind Bruce Springsteen's 10-show marathon at Giant Stadium in New Jersey. Overall, BTS has landed the sixth best grossing engagement in box score history. Billboard defines their box score as a report of all shows that an act plays at a single venue during a given tour or during a leg of a tour, excluding festivals, based on figures reported to Billboard. The music magazine also reports that what separates the boy band from other members of the $30 million club, like U2 and the Spice Girls, is that no other act had cracked the Hot 100 charts top 20 in the five years before their $30 million grosses. Another distinction, BTS is the first and only historically non-English act to top the 20 million mark in one engagement. The streets of Los Angeles, following the group's concerts, were teeming with fans eager for more. We like to keep them for mementos of like a good time, a good family trip and memories that we've had going to the concert. It was really nice. The thirst for K-pop is amazing. We've witnessed firsthand how strong a fan base K-pop and Korean culture have. It's proof of just how mainstream K-pop and Korean culture, including K-drama, food and beauty, is becoming across the globe. With BTS leading the charge. Han Sung, Arirang News. Local researchers are seeking to make use of drone technology to better respond to possible flooding as part of efforts to prevent related damage. A Cho Sung Min reports. South Korea has recently demonstrated a newly developed water management and surveillance system using high-tech drones. The government-funded project was launched following the nationwide floods that damaged some 8,400 households across 17 cities and provinces in August last year. The project leaders have pointed to ineffective management of water levels at the dams and a lack of inspections in local rivers as the main causes. As this area sustained heavy flood damage, various fourth industrial technologies are needed to effectively and scientifically manage the water. Developers say the drones will be dispatched to inspect and monitor water levels and provide essential information in real time. The gadgets also use a heat tracing technique to detect the presence of people who might be in dangerous areas and can send out evacuation warnings. The drones are also programmed to automatically return to the compound in case of adverse weather. They're also designed to float on water for over 30 minutes if unable to fly. They are almost ready to be deployed right away, but there are some restrictions over what's called beyond visual line of sight. So if the authorizations are made, they can be used. The developers say the drone system will first be implemented for a test run at Seomjin River in Cheolanamdo province before being expanded to other regions once further improvements are made. Cho Sung-min, Arirang News.
Money is essential for business and the government here is seeking to offer better financial support to startups that have ideas but lack resources. For more, G. Abilie joins me here in the studio. Welcome, G. Good afternoon, Sunny. So imagine yourself starting a brand new business with a brilliant idea to dominate the market. But you still need good infrastructure, good people, and to do all that, you need money. This is why Korea's government-backed fund of funds has launched what it dubs Foreign VC Investment Fund several years ago. And Fund of Funds, also known as Multi-Manager Investment, is a pooled investment fund that invests in other types of funds. The Korea Venture Investment Corporation, backed by the Ministry of SMEs and Startups, is a creator of the Foreign VC Investment Fund. It announced its latest selection of funds late last month, which would benefit from the second round of this year's global funding program. Through the second round, the Korea Venture Investment plans to inject 69 billion won or 58 million US dollars to 10 funds around the globe. A total of 23 venture capital firms across the globe have applied for the fund, requesting around 200 billion won. The total amount, which will be a combination of the funds from KVIC and the selected venture capital firms' contributions, is expected to hover above 1 trillion won. Right. Gee, so what conditions need to be met to have access to this fund? Right. So, as I mentioned, the purpose of the Global Fund program is directing foreign capital to Korean startups that benefit the country's uh, business climate. So, the selected VCs must invest more than the amount they received from KVIC to Korean startups, overseas affiliates of Korean companies, joint ventures created in conjunction with Korean companies, or startups founded by foreign nationals of Korean heritage. This condition is in line with the corporation's catchphrase, making virtuous cycle of venture ecosystem. In this round, the combined total of the minimum amount of the venture capital firms will reach $869 million. Right, I see. And where exactly are these CVs located, G? So the most number of the VCs are located in the United States, and there are four funds located in the U.S., uh, two in China and Southeast Asia, respectively, and the rest two in other regions. In the U.S., California-based Big Basin Capital and Goodwin Ventures, Collaborative Fund, and Northgate Capital will receive $21.5 million together. In China, Legend Capital and Fosun International will receive $11.5 million. In Southeast Asia, $30 million will go to Altara Ventures and a joint venture by Korea's KB Investment and RHL Ventures, leaving $12.2 million to France-based Eurozio and Singapore's Antler, which were categorized as being located in the other regions. Together with the first round conducted back in June, the total funding for this year's overseas investment program will surpass 2.3 trillion won. Right. VCs, by the way. I think That's I just right. CVs earlier on, G. Now, 2.3 trillion won. Do put that amount into perspective for us. Is that more or less than expected? It's a lot more than expected. Initially, KVIC expected the original funding to make up some 40% of the raised target of 400 billion won. The investment amount uh, at present is almost a six-fold jump from the target. The much higher than expected investment reflects foreign venture capital firms' rising appetite for startups here. The KVIC has been running the Foreign VC Investment Fund since 2013, infusing 412 billion won to create a total investment amount of 3.67 trillion won. Now, of that amount, 2.73 trillion won are foreign capital, a whopping 74.4%. Right. Gee, essentially, how has this initiative assisted startups thus far? So, so far, some 380 Korean startups received a total of 801.6 billion won through the Foreign VC Investment Fund, of which 51 were able to score follow-up investments from top-tier investors like New York-based Goldman Sachs and Beijing's Legend Capital. Korea's recent unicorns, namely IT service management company Viva Republica, which owns mobile banking provider TOS, grocery shopping app Curly, and real estate app Chipbang are all beneficiaries of such capital infusion through the Global Fund. A high-level KVIC official said he hopes the cycle of fresh infusion of foreign capital energizing the domestic startup scene will continue to benefit the overall economy. That's all for me today. All right, Chi, as always, thank you very much for that coverage. Great to be here.
starting on this Monday here in Korea, enhanced COVID-19 prevention measures are in place for four weeks to address escalating caseloads and potential risks of the new Omicron variant. For more, I have Dr. Kim Seng Tech from Institute Pasteur Korea. It's good to see you again, Dr. Kim. Good afternoon. I also have Professor Kim Mungyu from Yonsei University joining this session virtually. Professor Kim, hope you had a good weekend. Thank you for having me. Right, Dr. Kim, we'll start here in the studio. Following about one month of efforts to ease COVID-19 restrictions and to embrace a new normal, we have stronger prevention guidelines in place now. Let's begin then, Dr. Kim, with your assessment of our current COVID-19 situation. We have actually passed uh, the five weeks after, since we just started uh, sort of just living with uh, just COVID-19. And then the, the things that we have uh, witnessed so far is the increasing number of just the uh, total just cases for COVID-19, as well as the uh, also just increased number of uh, the severe COVID-19. For a former part, we are kind of just anticipated even just before just uh, living with COVID-19. But the latter one, which is just increasing just the severe COVID-19, is uh, kind of just, uh, uh, it's, uh, we did not actually expect uh, this kind of just increase. But then the overall just assessment from the government officials is that this is primarily due to the uh, some, uh, so just sort of just uh, the, uh, the breakthrough infection, especially in the nursing homes and the nursing hospitals. And this is quite just understandable because uh, the people at the, uh, those kind of the facilities actually just originally they are just very vulnerable to any kind of just the impact, impact from the any just sort of just infection and whatever, whatsoever. And then also uh, they are have a very weak just immunity. And then they were actually uh, there's some sort of just a priority groups to get uh, vaccinated. So their immunity is actually gradually just uh, just wanes, so that uh, they are basically just very vulnerable. Even any just sort of just uh, any out just outside this impact. So that's the kind of the thing that has happened. And then another uh, the sort of just unpredictable just the factor now we are just facing is uh, or the, the famous this Omicron variant. So the. Uh, we do not know just for sure the uh, how just uh, contagious and uh, how pathogenic this variant virus is. Uh, maybe it just may just end up with uh, very just the trivial things. But the thing is uh, that this is not unknown. This is not the this is not the uh, some known things at the moment. So uh, we will see just how just how just. Uh, uh, how much impact this variant will actually affect our just uh, the healthcare system and the general just uh, the trend of uh, COVID-19 infections. Right. Mm. And Professor Kim, among the new measures in place to deal with the uncertainties that Dr. Kim has just spoken about, there are caps on social gatherings and we have broader requirement of vaccine passes. When now may we start to witness the impact of these enhanced measures, Professor Kim? And will Korea be able to return to its efforts to, to embrace a new normal, do you think, after four weeks of tougher restrictions? It is a little bit difficult to say it is uh, tough in my point of view. Uh, I welcome the new rules, but uh, we might need many more weeks to... Uh, return to uh, uh, routine life, normal life. Uh, more strict and strong rules will see uh, an effect in short period of time. Uh, yeah, but we have to consider economics and education and there are many political events going around. Uh, so uh, I think uh, the rule is considered on all the aspects of our uh, society. But anyway, this is winter time, and we have to be vigilant all through this winter. And uh, uh, even though what kind of rules the government uh, gives out, we have to uh, keep uh, wearing masks and keep uh, social distancing and uh, think one more time if you have a, a social, social gathering. Professor Kim, you put a question mark, I would say, on the idea, on the word tough when I mentioned it. Do you suppose that current restrictions should be enhanced further? I hope so. You know, uh, we, well, we're heavy, having uh, 5,000 patients for some day and uh, it's going to increase for some time because uh, actually we cannot explain why this is happening and uh, there might be some uh, backup uh, of our uh, quarantine uh, plans right now. So that is a reason uh, I think this way. Right. And like Professor Kim, Dr. Kim, some critics claim the current prevention efforts are inadequate and that uh, stricter measures are necessary. What are your thoughts on this? 
Well, uh, I say I would say whenever just this kind of just a decision is announced, I, I think that uh, well, no, the decision can satisfy the every people. I mean, this is <coughs> kind of just outcome from the the very intense discussion among the uh, some government officials and also experts in the uh, some infectious diseases things like that. And I think uh, the just but the overall, I think the government will just pursue the uh, the, the current just uh, uh, the direction, which means that just living in the COVID-19. This is kind of uh, inevitable because uh, now we have. All over just the 80, now close to 80 percent of the vaccination rate, and then the, this is the kind of just a long term just projection is living with COVID-19. But the, depending on the some uh, very just evolving the situation, you can change just as a very short term period, like uh, just a, a little bit just a backdrop in the like some uh, public current measures, things like that. And then there are some uh, certain just uh, some factors that might just affect uh, this kind of uh, just uh, our just uh, sort of just uh, how can just uh, deal with uh, this kind of evolving situation. It's the first one is the the Omicron variant and then also some booster shot, the vaccination rate, and also some potential just, a, well, maybe just a availability of some oral drugs. So that might just affect the, uh, some, uh, the very short term course, but in the long term course, we will just follow the uh, some uh, living with COVID-19. Right. Professor Kim, as a pediatrician yourself, how do you respond to vaccine pass requirements for those aged 12 to 17 starting next February? Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, comment about the uh, effectiveness of uh, these vaccines right now. Uh, there was a report from USA that the uh, mortality rate decreased 11 times thanks to the vaccine and the uh, hospitalization was six times decreased thanks to the uh, vaccination. And actually, they prevent uh, actual infection about 60% by Pfizer, and they say it's going to be about 45% by AstraZeneca vaccination. And uh, it might also prevent some transmissions also. And uh, this uh, Delta variant, which is prevalent in Korea right now, uh, they might uh, uh, have a similar viral load even if uh, they got vaccinated compared to original Wuhan strain. But uh, the vaccine might short, shorten the uh, time of transmission. So that's the reason we got vaccination. Uh, it has more benefit than harm. And uh, now let's talk about the uh, age group from 12 to 17. Uh, still, there are more benefits compared to harm in this group. So uh, I strongly recommend two doses of uh, RNA vaccination for children uh, with diabetes, obesity, uh, congenital heart disease, and patients with epilepsy. And uh, I understand parents are so concerned about the safety. And as I work in the uh, emergency department, I see a lot of uh, patients and parents coming to uh, uh, emergency room. They visit because uh, uh, they got symptoms after a vaccination. But uh, thankfully, uh, most of them are non-specific. Uh, sometimes we see some patients with uh, myocarditis, chest pain. Uh, they might have to admit to hospital, but uh, they resolve uh, uh, after some period of uh, time. So uh, I recommend the vaccination for this group at least one dose if the, pa if the children is healthy without any comorbidity. Vaccine pass. Uh, the purpose of this vaccine pass should be encouraging the vaccination, not to restrict the uh, freedom or free activities. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, the government has to uh, uh, figure out how to make this uh, vaccine pass work efficiently. Right. Dr. Kim, let's now shift our focus to Omicron. What are the chances of this new variant replacing the Delta variant as the dominant strain? Well, uh, before just uh, talking about uh, that kind of uh, just the potential just uh, dominance over the, the fifth delta, let's look at the uh, some uh, current data. I mean that was available from the South Africa. The based on the da da data is now just a seventy four percent of just the uh, new infection is uh, actually due to the uh, some uh, Omicron. That's based on the, uh, the sampling the the results from the South Africa. And then before just uh, this Omicron, now just Delta is uh, predominant over just globally. But the before just the Delta variant, we have actually talked about many variants: Alpha variant, Beta, and Gamma 
my mother. And even before Alpha variant, there was no just uh, official classification as uh, the variant, but there was uh, some D614G, just a mutant. And then that was actually, D614G is the, actually just uh, appears all of the, the variant right now. So this is a variant is actually changing. And then except for the uh, alpha and delta, the beta and the gamma was kind of just uh, at the focus on just a specific area. And it actually did not have a chance to be some any global, just a, the global, just a predominant, just a variant. But so far, based on the data, this is very limited data so far. But uh, I think uh, Omicron has a chance to just uh, probably just uh, replacing just a uh, Delta as a predominant just a variant uh, globally. And then this is just a, just a just possibility. And then, as I said earlier in this program, the viruses kind of just uh, compete with each other. So it's a, we actually, in, in terms of just virology, we say this is kind of the viral fitness. The, if, the vi if a certain virus is more fit, then the, those, that virus has a more chances of just the just predominant, just the overall, just as a, it, it has a chance of just outcompete the uh, other viruses. And the, so far, uh, the uh, Omicron seems to have a, such kind of just a, just a, some better just a viral fitness compared to others as a prior the variants. So I think it is likely, but we will see. Right. And staying with Omicron, based on the information disclosed thus far, Professor Kim, about Omicron, that is, what appear to be the characteristic features of its spread? There are about 50 mutations in the uh, genome of 30,000 uh, in the uh, coronavirus, and about 30 mutations are located in the uh, S spike protein. So, uh, in vitro data, I mean, test tube data is going to show up within two weeks, whether uh, how much it is a problem or not. But uh, clinical study is going to need more and more time than just two weeks. It's going to take about uh, many weeks, even months. And the uh, original Wuhan strain uh, shown to have a R number about two. And the Delta variant is twice of the uh, Wuhan strain. And now they say, uh, uh, Omicron is about twice of Delta variant. And uh, it started in Southern Africa. And if you look at the uh, uh, Kutan area of South Africa, the population is relatively young and they are facing the uh, fourth wave right now, but there's no increase in mortality so far. And they say the oxygen demand is not increasing. That's the good news. Patients admitting to hospital in Kutang area have a incidental COVID-19 infection, which means they don't visit the hospital because of uh, COVID symptoms. They come to other reasons and they happen to have the uh, uh, COVID-19 infection, which means this strain might not be that uh, virulent. Uh, the uh, demographics of South Africa is quite different from South Korea. I mean. Uh, we have more elderly group and uh, South Africa is quite young. So we cannot say it will be the same in Korea also. So yeah, we have to wait for more weeks to uh, see whether it's clinically different or not. But there's one thing I'm more concerned about. Uh, in Korea, we are, uh, we, our ICU beds and the intensive care uh, personnel are quite overloaded. So uh, we have to control uh, the uh, severe cases lower uh, to uh, prevent any uh, uh, overwhelming of uh, the uh, uh, intensive care units, which might uh, result in high mortality. So yeah, uh, we have to uh, think about the Omicron, but there's one more thing important than that right now. Right. And back with Omicron, Dr. Kim, some pundits have been saying that Omicron may signal the end of the pandemic. Could you explain this rather optimistic outlook for us? Well, the, uh, well first of all, uh, just uh, in addition to the, uh, the Professor Kim's the, the talk, I want to just say the, uh, there are some more than the theories of just mutations found in the, the spike protein in this uh, Omicron the variant. But I have to say the uh, many mutations do not necessarily just mean that uh, this is the, the, all those mutations are all just additive or synergistic because uh, some of the mutations were actually all were just found in from the some uh, in the other prior just variants and then we know the uh, some uh, very special feature of a certain just mutation but that does not that 
uh, that that does not mean that all those mutations do just uh, combine to make a very just more just a severe or very pathogenic just the trait. Sometimes even very serious just a mutation when they just uh, the present just a. Uh, they alone, they, they're pathogenic, but they combine. Sometimes they are just attenuated, maybe sometimes just weak. So it, so a combination itself does not just mean that more pathogenic or deadly viruses. And also the, uh, the variant, uh, yeah, so, and one of the also just a kind of a prejudice among the public is that variant, kind of just a uh, variant, is not just equal to the uh, some more just the pathogenic viruses. So it's just a kind of just a very the natural the phenomenon of just viral evolution. So I think uh, in terms of just uh, some virus evolution and also reflecting some uh, the, 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 pa the, the past, uh, just uh, some history of just some virus just outbreak, for example, like uh, Spanish just flu, the, I think a long-term projection is uh, this uh, COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2, would just uh, in the end uh, likely be uh, some uh, endemic just the viruses, which is uh, some endemic infection, which is very attenuated viruses, sort of just a uh, coexist our just human beings without just harming just too much to our just healthcare systems. And then this kind of just, uh, the, it can be some uh, years of just a procedure, but then this kind of just interaction between the, uh, the viruses and our just the host, in, in, this, in this case, our just human, the human beings and the viruses change and then our humans also change in terms of the immunity. So the, all those complex I interaction will just result in the overall just the attenuation process. But I think we have to actually distinguish between just the long-term process and the short-term process. What I said so far is kind of just a long-term process. But in the case of short-term process, you might not, we, the, all those variants does, may not be just necessarily mean the uh, some, uh, all, every variant the new variant does not mean the, uh, the weakened and just attenuated viruses. But the, one of the, uh, actually just a recent report about just the, the maybe this is, might be uh, some end, end of the uh, uh, COVID-19, the, the, the variant is that some uh, recombinant, maybe this is kind of just recombinant viruses. And then some report says the, uh, uh, from the SARS-CoV-2, the viral genome, that they found that there's a piece of the uh, common cold, the coronavirus, which is actually just a human coronavirus 229E. This is the, uh, there are actually the uh, seven known just human coronaviruses. The three of them just cause very severe just uh, the disease such as uh, this uh, SARS-CoV-2 and the MERS-CoV and the SARS-CoV-1. And the other, the four uh, human coronaviruses actually cause very mild, just uh, the disease is very, very mild case, such as just very, very mild cold. And this is a 229 is a one of such things. And this kind of a recombination is n it's not really just a, a very unusual thing. The, uh, this is a coronavirus, the different kind of coronavirus, and the SARS-CoV-2 is coronavirus. When they uh, somehow, if the uh, viruses coexist within the one cells, there are many chances of just recombine. So that uh, the one of the, the outcome from this recombination is a, a piece of uh, just one coronavirus can be integrated to uh, another just coronavirus. And actually there are many just uh, coronavirus, unknown coronavirus in the, uh, the bat. So there are many just uh, scientists also just uh, doubt that uh, even this SARS-CoV-2 is probably maybe just outcome of a recombination within the, the bat. Just, uh, this is animal reservoir so for many numerous just uh, coronaviruses. Right, I see. And so, Professor Kim then, under the given circumstances, do you believe our current vaccines remain our best defense against Omicron? Our situation is uh, fighting against Delta variant right now. Uh, Omicron will be the next. Uh, so the vaccine effectiveness is approved to decrease case fatality rates, hospitalization, and shortens the uh, transmission period uh, for Delta variant. Uh, breakthrough infection is rare, but possible in Delta variant infection. And uh, if a fully vaccinated person gets uh, infected with Omicron variant, this is not a new phenomenon. Some might think that they're going to wait for a new vaccine effective, and ef effective for Omicron, but this is not wise. Uh, it's going to take a long time to have new uh, vaccine for Omicron, and it's going to take time to get into Korea. We might miss the opportunity to control this fourth wave. Uh, most of the current vaccines are somehow effective against Delta variant, and I hope 
uh, for Omicron also. So if you are facing the time to get the, uh, the third shot or booster shot, I hope that everybody should get it. Right. So in the time being, we can rely on our current vaccines then. Correct. And moving beyond vaccines, Dr. Kim, what are your thoughts on the efficacy of our current treatment options against Omicron? Uh, well, uh, for the uh, uh, current uh, treatment option, uh, first of all, I, will, I have to say the, uh, the monoclonal antibody because uh, whenever the uh, this kind of the variant just uh, just appear, the most concerning just the part is that whether our just the current vaccine and uh, our therapeutics are still just effective against the, uh, those variants, and then one of the uh, the, uh, the one of the most uh, vulnerable the therapeutics that we have right now against the uh, the, the variant is the monoclonal antibodies, and the monoclonal antibodies were actually developed to just block the uh, interaction between viral spike protein and the uh, host receptor protein. So in just in principle, the, uh, these monoclonal antibodies could be very vulnerable to some source kind of just uh, mutations on the spike protein. So that they're just a neutralize, neutralizing efficacy, maybe just a drug, but depending on the, uh, the developers, I, what I heard is that the, uh, maybe just Eli Lilly antibody is more like uh, more severely affected by this, uh, probably this variant, and then probably followed by the uh, regeneron monoclonal antibody and then probably less likely affected by the, uh, uh, in the case of the biotechnology and the GSK. And then other the drugs that we actually do using right now is the, the dexamethasone. Uh, this is the drug we use for severe COVID-19. And this dexamethasone that also other some steroid drugs actually is not are not affected by this, this is mutation. This, um, the drugs actually just uh, sort of just uh, acting by just reducing just uh, excessive immune responses in our body. So the, this is the drug that we are using for severe COVID-19 would not be just affected by this variant. And uh, in addition, and, uh, we are actually talking about some uh, oral drugs now just being just uh, probably be about to be just approved by the FDA for some Merck drug and the Pfizer drugs. The mechanism of these drugs are actually is quite just a distinct. Just a, it's a separate from the mutations at the, the spike protein, and then we will see some uh, uh, experimental results. But my expectation is that uh, this Merck drug and the Pfizer drug would not be affected by the uh, this uh, just uh, many just dozens of mutations found in just uh, uh, the just uh, uh, Omicron as a variant. And hopefully you're right. We'll keep our fingers crossed. Yeah. All right, Dr. Kim, as always, thank you very much for your words, Professor Kim. Thank you very much for your time and your thoughts today. Thank you. Right. Tougher COVID-19 prevention guidelines are in place for the next four weeks. Do seek to abide by these new measures to ensure your health and that of those around you. Thank you for watching.